give it up again for Ina Freed. So our next guest was listed on Time's Top 100 for most influential people to know when it comes to AI. You may know her as a very vocal advocate for privacy in an era where the technology seems to have made privacy seem like an antiquated notion. I'm really glad we're ending today, although we have one demo after that, but this conversation is so important. I'm fascinated by the technology. I think there are a million interesting uses, good uses of the technology, but it's really important that we get this right, and I really hope that we have a really thoughtful conversation um, that leaves you all with a lot to think about. So please help me welcome the president of the Signal Foundation, Meredith Whitaker. Thanks, Meredith. Um, so I mostly want to talk about AI, but I'm actually going to start with something that's slightly orthogonal, um, which is um, Signal has been the subject of a pretty intense campaign. For those who don't know Signal, you should. How it's, many people use Signal? How many people use Signal? Okay. okay. Well, by the end of this, I think we'll double that. Um, it's, it's an encrypted confidential messaging system that's actually encrypted. Um, and you've been subject to a pretty intense campaign from Telegram, one of the competitors, but also a lot of people who stand to benefit from weaker security. Why should the public care? Well, I think everyone cares about their privacy. If you close your eyes and imagine every email you've ever sent dumped in a database searchable by everyone you know, you feel that? Right? We all care. We all have stakes in this. And when we look at this from a geopolitical perspective, we also recognize as scholars of history or even people who are observing the dynamics in our politically volatile time now, that those in power often constitute their power via information asymmetry, by knowing more about their adversaries or their subjects and using that to their advantage, to oppress, to undermine, to have an advantage at the negotiating table. I think anyone who's spent some time in the Snowden documents just knows exactly how powerful these forms of mass surveillance can be when in the hands of an interested government. So I don't think I have to belabor the point that privacy is important and that privacy in the context of a tech ecosystem that currently constitutes itself via mass surveillance, via collecting huge amounts of data, using it to sell ads or train AI models perhaps, um, provides a really significant attack surface when we're talking about that combined with some of the will to power, some of the will to surveil, and the potential to weaponize that type of centralized surveillance data. And so are you guys with me? <laughs> and the big why it matters is, you know, we used to have a fair amount of our privacy came through obscurity. It just, before technology, you just couldn't listen to everyone's conversation. Like, That's not protecting us anymore. Literally for hundreds of thousands of years, most of human development, most things were by default private, right? You talk to someone, maybe someone was eavesdropping, but they were someone you knew, they were in your little town, your hamlet, your fight them, whatever, and that wasn't logged in a database and then sort of read with some OCR technology immediately searchable by a centralized corporation in the jurisdiction of the US, which is right now in what I'll, my favorite euphemism right now, politically volatile times. Right? It's a very, very different paradigm. And I think over the last 20 years, what we've seen is an industry grow up around claims of human benefit, around claims of scientific progress that we're just now recognizing is built on some pretty toxic foundations, on the centralization of surveillance, on the centralization of technological power. And most of the companies that have that kind of monopoly status, that have sort of built themselves as, you know, the, the surveillance giants, the big tech companies, whatever you want to call them, are jurisdictions in the US. So I want to bring it now into the generative AI moment we're in. Again, I feel like today is offering a reality check of where we are. Um, one of the things that is undoubtedly true about this moment is most of the technology is being provided by a few companies. You've talked a lot about why that probably isn't a good thing. Where are we in this moment in terms of the concentration of power within generative AI? Yeah, I, 
I love this question and I can't answer it without reference to history because I think there's a really important question that underlies this that we don't ask often enough. And oftentimes maybe that's because we're embarrassed, we're not sure, like, does everyone else know this? I don't know this. But that question is, what is AI? Right? AI, in my view, having you know, gone through the archives, spent you know, over a decade studying this, is more or less a marketing term. It was invented in 1956 by the cognitive and computer scientist John McCarthy, who's now named the father of AI. And in subsequent interviews, he's super clear about why he coined the term. There were two primary reasons. The first, he wanted to exclude an academic rival, a man named Norbert Wiener, who had invented the term cybernetics. And at that time, the field was constituted under cybernetics. He didn't want to invite this guy. He wanted to be the father of his own thing, not a disciple to Norbert. Pretty common academic will. The second reason, which is even more common in academia, is he wanted grant money. Because at that time, we're just following World War II. This is the Cold War era where dreams of omniscience in the face of nuclear Russia were motivating a huge amount of funding into computational technologies to try to have that Cold War advantage. So he was looking for DARPA funding. And he coined the term artificial intelligence, and it kind of stuck. But over the subsequent 70 plus years, that term has been applied to many, many different technologies that really don't look anything like each other. So I think we can use that to understand it's very flexible. It's a kind of un, you know, it's a, it's a floating signifier to be a bit theoretical about it. And then the question becomes, why are we obsessed with it right now? Why did it emerge in the last 10 years as the big new thing? Why did it have its resurgence? And to understand that, we need to recognize at the base of this technology is this monopoly surveillance business model. Are the companies that through the 2000s established themselves, the Googles, the Metas, the Microsofts, as platform monopolies, as cloud monopolies, were able to collect a huge amount of data and build up huge, powerful infrastructure to feed these businesses. So you know, most of this was advertising, kind of you know, calibrating ads and engagement. You know, there's also the cloud business model. But effectively, the AI we're talking about now is a derivative of that business model. It takes huge amounts of data collected by these companies, and we know like data is scarce. Everyone's sort of you know, trading, you know, trying to broker deals with different news organizations or Reddit, get as much data as you can to trade your AI. And then it was the companies that had the data and had the powerful computational infrastructure to actually run this training and access market. So you know, none of that means AI isn't useful, but it does mean it is very contextually it, it is in the context of this surveillance business model, and it is favoring the, mono, the, the big tech monopolies that establish themselves so that they do have that infrastructure, they do have that data. It's not so much a product of scientific progress, it is a product of a recognition you could do new things with old algorithms when you had compute and when you had data. That again, very few actors have. And how are those companies doing? For example, I was in Seattle a couple of weeks ago. Microsoft showed off this new technology for the PC called Recall, where it's going to let you recall anything you've ever seen because it's taking constant screenshots and saving that. Is that a good thing for society? Oh, God, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I play softball in case you don't yeah, know. Is that, um, do we love this? No. Um, I mean, I think we should be horrified, right? At least those of us who have a you know, a bit of depth of understanding of what this tech actually does and the track record of these companies and the political environment in which they're operating in, right? You know, I, I do get this question as the president of Signal, someone very devoted to privacy, why do you spend so much time talking about AI? Why do you continue engaging in academic scholarship around AI? And Recall, I think, is a very good example that the Venn diagram between privacy and AI is actually a circle. Because what recall is, in my view, is a desperate attempt to find a market for capital-intensive technologies that need a return on investment. So Microsoft is shoving this, you know, what is effectively spyware into their new um, and into their new devices, into their new version of Windows. And already the security reviews are horrifying. Recall, as it is constituted now, is on by default. 
So you have this spyware taking snapshots of everything you do, then subjecting them to ocular, you know, basically AI that scans those and transcribes those into a database that anyone with access to your computer, whether they get that remotely or with physical access to your device, can then read. That is an incredibly dangerous honeypot for hackers, hostile nation states, anyone who gets access to your machine. And that will be deployed, again, opt out, which means it's working on everyone's device you know, without most people knowing, because we know very, very few people change the default settings. So this is an incredible, I would say, you know, the disrespect inherent in making this move. The actual abdication of responsibility for a company that is providing core infrastructure for billions of people around the world to subject them to this kind of danger. And for me, the offense is really, this is, you know, people run Signal on their desktop. People for whom privacy and security is a life or death issue. And do you think some of this comes from the fact that there are a lot of basically most of Silicon Valley is run by mostly white, mostly men, who maybe don't understand how the information might be used against them, their own data. I mean, yes, I think people who haven't faced many risks or have a you know, blood level understanding of marginalization and what it means to be subject to you know, those with power over you make really bad decisions about this fairly frequently. But I also think there is a sort of group think around AI where people aren't pausing to actually differentiate between where it are large models that recognize patterns in data useful, because there are places, right? This is not useless technology. And where do we need to leave it alone and leave money on the table? And that question is not being answered. And particularly in the context, you know, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars to train these models. So the capital you have to throw at training and then calibration, and then inference as well is huge. And so there is deep pressure from companies that are basically promising God and delivering email prompts to make some return on investment on this technology. And I think there's, you know, this is a sign for me of desperation. It's a sign of Microsoft just, you know, shooting themselves in the knee. And again, they are snapshotting signal messages on device. That is an incredibly profound violation of trust and, you know, You've just, um, you know, I, I think we really need to recognize just how serious, you know, kind of hijacking people's trust and their, you know, digital environments, um, you know, how serious that hijacking of trust really is. And, and think, you know, kind of zoom out and think what other, what other powers have we ceded to these companies that we really need to take back and, you know, regain the ability to deliberate and direct more democratically. Given that that is where the power is, given that that's where the technology lies, is in these for-profit companies, given that they're investing billions, is there a different way you think this story can play out, and how would that happen? Well, lovely that you asked, because Signal is actually a nonprofit, um, and we are a nonprofit, you know, not because this is a nice little charity, but because we looked at the cold, hard business model of tech and realize that if we were a for-profit, it is very likely that we would be pushed to erode our privacy guarantees in an industry where collecting, selling, making use of personal data is the primary economic driver. So I think there are certainly other models of tech. There are certainly other models of organizing our economy, of organizing our social relations. All of those you know, kind of fit together. But I think we need to take very seriously the fact that you know, we're in a politically volatile time. These companies you know, serve whatever government their jurisdiction in. They have data and the power to control the infrastructure across our lives and institutions that has never been seen in human history. You know, this would, the, the Stasi would cry with you know, absolute glee if they recognize just how much access they could be given through these technologies, how much insight into people's individual lives, how much power to infer highly personal things about people and communities they would have if they deployed these technologies. And right now those are in the hands of for-profit companies that will act like for-profit companies, putting revenue and growth above other things because that's how they're constituted. And that is not a healthy way to make such significant decisions about you know, not only US, but you know, global 
institutions, governments, and societies. But I did hear in what you say also a cautionary tale to those who look too far to governments to regulate this, that their interests also may not be aligned. How concerned are you that in, in our efforts to try and counterbalance the giant tech companies, we hand over too much power? For example, I think you've spoken about the dangers of a TikTok ban in how, for example, if we have another Trump administration, how that might be weaponized. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to be very careful about assuming, you know, a kind of almost like colloquial Superman story that we're just creating tools that the good guys will use on the bad guys, right? And my, my partic you know, the TikTok ban was clearly kind of politically weaponized, and my, my argument there was that, you know, giving the executive branch in the context of a, you know, authoritarian-looking regime the power to declare based on sort of, you know, fairly flimsy evidence, at least what was presented publicly, that, you know, some entity is, I think it was foreign, foreign adversary controlled was the term, is an incredibly flexible tool. And, you know, post 9-11, we saw similar powers misused over and over again. So, you know, I think we, I think we need to recognize that, you know, the, the significant political will that would accompany kind of getting access to surveillance data, getting access to the information platforms that are currently controlled by five companies, four of whom are jurisdiction in the US, so it's, you know, TikTok, YouTube, X, et cetera. Um, and that that is, you know, traditionally governments have sought exactly that kind of power through, you know, control over news media, control over more analog forms and and right now it is centralized and you know much easier to influence and access than those previous iterations and spans globally so you have you know most of the world reliance on five companies four of whom are jurisdiction in the US to uh, you know to understand our shared reality to access our shared media ecosystem well unfortunately on that light note we are going to have to leave it there um, but i encourage you to keep following uh, Meredith's work. Um, she's been working in this space since before most of us were using the term AI. She led the Google walkout uh, to pay attention to Project Maven, which um, if you've been following the news, AI and warfare is a whole other subject we didn't get to get into today. But please keep following Meredith's work. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Ina. Thank you all.